Megan, I'm Steve Thanks. Johnson. I'm a member of the board of the Environmental Caucus, and uh, I'm also on the state's advisory committee for uh, the $850 million settlement in the East Metro. Um, just a couple of words about uh, PFAS before we introduce uh, first Jay Eisens from MCEA and then Representative Amy Moslawak, who I hopefully have pronounced correctly. Um, and, uh, and then we can take questions at the end. Um, uh, as I guess most of you know, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, uh, which I can't pronounce correctly, and that's why everyone calls them PFAS. Um, it's an enormous family of thousands of different chemicals. Um, two of them uh, are known to cause health effects and others, uh, I guess we don't know too much. Um, they're called forever chemicals because they don't break down in the environment and they don't break down in water. Uh, they don't break down in your bloodstream. Um, so they bioaccumulate in both humans and other living organisms, and some of them have been known to be toxic. They're in everything, um, food packaging, Gore-Tex, firefighting foam, carpet, uh, the, the fabrics in your car, nonstick cookware. Um, uh, they're all over the planet. They're found in the blood of polar bears. They're in us, they're in our water supply in varying amounts. They're in fish. Um, they're found in bald eagles, some of the highest concentrations of PFAS found in an organism in the world were at bald eagles in the Mississippi River between St. Paul and Hastings. Um, and they're all over the state. There have been problems in Pine Island, Bemidji, Duluth, and the East Metro. The East Metro has gotten the most publicity because of the $850 million settlement with 3M. Uh, and that has contaminated groundwater for 174,000 people, myself included. I'm on a private well in Washington County. And uh, my well was contaminated with PFAS. I am a cancer survivor. Whether I got it from PFAS or the BPA in my Nalgene bottle or some other of a million different sources, I don't know. But um, And uh, as we learn more about health impacts, the acceptable limit of the, of the most studied compounds, PFOA and PFOS, keeps getting reduced. So um, we know very little about many of the other compounds. And, um, with that brief introduction, I'd like to introduce Jay Eidsness from the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, Advocacy excuse me. And uh, he's going to talk about health, health effects and some other important things that uh, we need to know. So Jay, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to try to get a PowerPoint up here just to kind of um, looks like Megan, you need to allow me to share my screen. Just so yes. I'm, I'm, you know what, let me do it for you. Great, that would be even better. Just so you're not all staring at me, it's more interesting to look at some, some fun slides. Um, so as Steve mentioned, my name is Jay Eidsness. I'm a staff attorney at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. We are a St. Paul-based nonprofit that has used science and law for, to protect Minnesota's environment and the health of its people for over 40 years. So tonight I hope to cover a few things. As Steve mentioned, I will talk about the health effects relating to consuming PFAS or drinking water laced with PFAS. Um, I will also talk about how PFAS enters the environment, problems regulators face in responding to these chemicals, and then a few legislative ideas that we can help protect Minnesota. Next slide, please. Um, I'm trying, I'm sorry. That's all right. Well, while that's going, um, so for the next 10 minutes or so, I do want to scare you a little bit. And it's a good fear. It's to kind of motivate you to think about solutions to this serious problem. Um, to get ahead of this public health crisis, we will need help from our legislative leaders. I'm gonna give you a lot of information and we'll try not to talk too quickly, but I do welcome comments and questions. At the end, I've included my contact information and some information of my colleagues. And we're happy to speak later about any additional questions or comments you may have or to further brainstorm some potential solutions. Um, so now before we get into the bad stuff, I do want to give you a glimmer of optimism. So I'd like to stress that Minnesota has a real opportunity to be a leader on this issue. As you probably know, and as Steve mentioned, um, our agencies recently unveiled their plan of addressing the PFAS contamination in the East Metro, and they're working hard to stop that from getting worse. Um, so although we face some of the worst PFAS contamination in the country, there is an opportunity for Minnesota to seize this moment by taking bold legislative action to curb this serious threat. So the big takeaway of the health effects is that we really just don't know that much. Um, an example of where the science is trending 
uh, we can look at Minnesota's health risk limits for just one of these molecules, one of these compounds. So PFOS is one of those legacy PFAS that 3M produced uh, back in the last century. And it was commonly found in many consumer products, nonstick cookware, stain resistant fabrics, et cetera. Um, so in 2002, the state of Minnesota started regulating this chemical uh, through what they call health-based values. So these are numerical limits that um, the state says anything above this level is considered toxic and anything below this level poses little to no risk to human health. So in 2002, Minnesota's health-based value for this one PFAS compound, PFOS, was 1,000 parts per trillion. Just five years later, that number was revised to 300 parts per trillion. And then three years ago in 2018, that number was further revised to 15 parts per trillion. So in less than two decades, we went from 1,000 parts per trillion, where we thought that was the safe, safe level, to now we're at 15 parts per trillion. So you can see the dramatic leap in you know, a short amount of time really underscores how little we know about these chemicals. Um, so related to that, uh, the health effects of ingesting these compounds are still rapidly developing. Uh, we do know that they are linked to certain cancers like kidney cancer, liver cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Um, it's also linked to reproductive problems, endocrine disruption, and nursing mothers can pass PFAS to infants through their breast milk, which can cause bone mineral density issues, increase the risk of developmental and autoimmune disorders in newborns. So one area of research that I'm really kind of interested about is um, vaccine efficacy linked to PFAS contamination. So a few months ago, I was speaking with uh, Dr. Philippe Grandjean. He is a uh, world-renowned expert. He's Dutch, he works for Harvard, and he was retained by the state of Minnesota to assist them in their litigation against 3N. And I was talking with him about emerging research that shows PFAS consumption is linked to an adverse um, outcome with vaccine efficacy. So vaccines were less efficient if you had more PFAS in your body which uh, I think is extremely problematic in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, again, this just kind of highlights how little we know about these chemicals and we're learning more and more as the science is developing. Um, next slide, please. So how do these, how do these chemicals get into the environment? Um, there are three main pathways that I wanna just touch on briefly today. Um, the first is fire training and response sites. So firefighting foam that was used by firefighters in their training exercises, for many years, firefighting foam contained PFAS. Um, we have thankfully phased a lot of that out and are no longer using that for the firefighting exercises. But this is why we are seeing groundwater contamination at the Bemidji Airport and at the Duluth Air National Guard base, for example. Um, industrial sites are another source of entry into the environment. And we can just look at the East Metro. Uh, between 1950 and about 2000, 3M disposed of PFAS wastes at facilities in Cottage Grove, Oakdale, Woodbury, and the Washington County landfill. So sometimes these releases from industrial sites are deliberate, and sometimes they're accidental, but either way, once that happens, they are in the environment and they're extremely difficult to get rid of. The last kind of source into the environment is through waste streams. So if you have that nonstick cookware with Teflon on it, you throw it away, it'll likely end up in a landfill where it may mix with other products that contain PFAS. And the PFAS will slough off those products, filter down into the, the leachate, the kind of water substance at the bottom of landfill, where it is then concentrated with PFAS and all sorts of other chemicals. And sometimes it can leach through the layer, the plastic liner that is supposed to keep everything contained and then enter the groundwater. Um, and oftentimes when they try to dispose of the leachate, uh, it's really difficult, expensive, complicated to um, eradicate the PFAS, so you often just take it out, try to treat it unsuccessfully, and then it goes back into the landfill to eventually kind of make its way into the environment um, once again. Next slide, please. So one piece of really sobering information is that of the 5,000 or so PFAS that are in existence, and I do want to emphasize that you know, we use PFAS as kind of a shorthand to refer to substances or compounds that have these polyfluorinated bonds. So there are about 5,000 or so that we know of in existence. Um, and many were produced intentionally for an industry and commerce, commerce, other types of commercial purposes. But some of these 5,000 are actually byproducts. Um, they're the result of chemical transformation in the environment or a byproduct of manufacturing. So we have this soup of growing chemicals that present a lot of major issues. And one of these issues is this knowledge and data gap that our regulators are currently facing. 
So what is that? Um, you know, this gap that our regulators have is they just don't really know what to look for. Um, companies are often not required to report the PFAS they are producing. And often if they are reporting it to the EPA or another regulator, um, that information is protected as confidential business information and can't really be released to the wider public or to other agencies to help combat the issue. So this is hugely important for a lot of reasons. Well, one of the main issues that I think um, that we should focus on is the way that we test for these chemicals is through this analytical modeling. And in order to take advantage of this modeling, you have to actually provide the model with an input list of known PFAS chemicals for the model to look for. So we're only looking for the PFAS that we know. And according to PCA, they only know about 40 PFAS compounds. So they're only able to input about 40 of those compounds in the analytical model when they're testing water. So there are hundreds, if not thousands of other chemicals that are potentially in that water that we just don't know if they're there because the model is not trying to pick them up. So the science is advancing in this area. Um, they are working to have the model um, be that so you don't need to kind of pre-select the ones to look for, but that is slow to catch up. It's expensive, it's time consuming. And a lot of this could be filled by just providing more information to our uh, state and federal regulators. Um, so one thing I, I always think about when I think of disclosure is there was a recent article in the Star Tribune a couple of weeks ago, perhaps you saw it, and it talked about 3M's decision back in the late 1970s not to disclose the health risks of PFAS to the federal government. So 3M knew that this posed, a, this posed human health risks, that it was bioaccumulating in its workers. Um, but the company said, you know, that's not bad enough to report this to the government. But in an internal memo, the company strongly recommended or urgently recommended that all reasonable steps be taken to immediately reduce exposure of employees to these compounds. So I think we can see that if you put the burden on the company to disclose a lot of this information, and oftentimes they don't make the, the decision that's in the best interest of public health. So I think that's a, a loophole or a gap that's worth uh, exploring if it can be closed. Uh, next slide, please. So to brainstorm some legislative ideas, I do first want to applaud the legislature for taking action in banning PFAS and food packaging. Um, this is a substantial and meaningful step that will make a real dif difference. And Representative Wozniak will talk more about this soon. So let's build off that. Um, California, for example, recently banned PFAS in a wide range of juvenile products. These products are specifically defined in the bill. Again, PFAS is more acutely toxic to those sensitive populations. So if we can remove it from the products that our infants and newborns are gonna be handling on a regular basis, that seems like a smart thing to do. Um, so labeling is another piece in this puzzle. Uh, there's no requirement that products containing PFAS be appropriately labeled. And I see two uh, obvious benefits of proper labeling. The first is it can help consumers make different purchasing choices. Um, and perhaps market forces can drive uh, industry away from using PFAS if people just don't purchase these products. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, um, if PFAS products are labeled correctly, consumers will have the information available to make the right decision when the, uh, the life of that product has expired. So instead of taking your nonstick cookware that has a bunch of scratches, because like me, you eat your eggs straight from the pan with a fork, um, instead of just throwing it away, you take it to a hazardous waste facility, similar like what you do with your paint or paint thinner, um, and you give it to the proper authorities so they can put it in a separate place or deal with it accordingly. You know, how they deal with it, there are a lot of different options and solutions, but it's a lot better to be segregated from the regular scheme of garbage than if it just goes into the landfill where it can then mix with other products. And then we have this problem of it getting into the groundwater. And the last thing I really wanna emphasize is that PFAS, again, is not just one or two or a dozen different chemicals. We're talking thousands, and more are being developed every, every year. So it's important that we regulate this uh, as a body of chemicals rather than trying to do it on a piecemeal basis. And I like to draw an analogy to federal law and control, controlled substances law. So the, there's a federal law that's known as the analog law, which basically says that if there is a chemical that is substantially similar to a controlled substance, that control, that substance is also illegal. So this is in response to a lot of the designer drugs that would avoid prosecution um, by you know, adjusting the chemical structure of that compound ever so slightly. And then they would say, well, it's not a controlled substance anymore because it's different. Um, so rather than playing whack-a-mole, 
um, which is you know a never-ending losing battle, the federal government said, okay, anything that is substantially similar to a controlled substance is also illegal. So I think something like that is a great way that we can look to regulate PFAS because if we try to do it on a chemical by chemical basis, we're just never gonna get ahead of this problem. So I know I ran through a lot of information in a short amount of time. I really wanna thank you for listening to me speak about this complicated uh, but hugely important issue. Uh, here's my contact information. I've listed two of my colleagues as well. Um, we at MCEA have been engaging with PFAS for quite a while. Um, and we hope to continue working with the legislature and with our state regulators to ensure that Minnesota has um, strict protections for its environment and for the health of all of us here in the great state of Minnesota. So now I want to turn it over to Representative Wozniak to talk more about the food packaging ban. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Representative Wozniak, take it away. Thanks, Steve. Um, thanks, Jay, for that uh, good introduction to PFAS and what it all means. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I guess I should introduce myself first. I'm Representative Amy Wozniak. Um, I represent District 38B in the Minnesota House, um, which includes um, White Bear Lake, part of White Bear Lake, White Bear Township, um, Delwood, North Oaks, and part of Hugo. Um, and for those who have maybe followed news on toxic chemicals, uh, Water Gremlin is in my district. Um, and so I am not new to the toxic chemical discussion as we have been dealing with that situation for uh, the past few years um, and sort of decided to tackle this PFAS issue um, because of my experience um, with toxic chemical legislation. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the legislation that was passed um, during the last legislative session um, that the PFAS ban in food packaging um, that Jay mentioned was an important priority for us and we were able to um, to get that passed, um, we had to do a little bit of negotiating on the um, language of the of the legislation as well as the effective date to try and sort of allow time for um, the the folks who are making these products to to have time to phase them out. So that was that was a compromise that we that we were able to get done, but it was um, it, it's done and and we have this ban now and it's going to be um, effective on January first of twenty twenty five. So that's. That's where we ended up with that. And it's a, it, one of those things that we know that um, the PFAS uh, in the food packaging, the food packaging ends up in our landfills and then continues from there, as Jay mentioned, sort of through the process to getting um, into our groundwater and then drinking water for folks in some areas. Um, the MPCA, if you're following along with some of the news on PFAS, the MPCA several months ago um, said that they had found uh, PFAS at uh, pretty much all of the closed landfills that they manage across the state. And uh, in some cases, the amount of PFAS they were finding um, in the groundwater was substantially uh, numerous times higher than the values that exist in terms of keeping the environment and people safe. So that's a, a big concern that that is sort of another addition to the plate of things that we were already doing with PFAS. Um, another another thing that we'll have to tackle. Um, in addition to the, the ban on food packaging, um, there's actually a significant amount of funding um, as part of as part of our environment and natural resources omnibus bill this this year um, to help reduce sources of PFAS um, and specifically sort of around the um, solid waste and, and wastewater treatment facilities. Um, there's a lot of PFAS that goes into those facilities that actually isn't generated by those facilities, but it's important to figure out what those sources are and then to, to put some time and effort into uh, figuring it out and then and working to reduce those sources. So that's an initiative that got funded. And then there was also funding for um, managing PFAS in uh, land applied biosolids. So for those who are familiar with how agriculture works, there's there's PFAS in um, in the solids that are applied to um, to different crops, and that obviously there's concern about um, that there's PFAS in that, but also in that material, but also that um, that that material um, being applied could transfer PFAS to um, the actual crops that it's being applied to. So that's something that. We have funding for looking uh, more into that and the impacts that that has on um, on our environment and health. And then there's also um, some funding for um, sort of a grant program um, to explore some new technology um, to protect drinking water and the environment from PFAS. So right now, as as um, Steve sort of mentioned, these are forever chemicals and they and they don't they don't go away. And so looking at ways that we can um, address the the contamination and um, think about ways to, to get rid of that so it's not in our drinking water. So there's a, a 
pilot sort of a pilot project that's being funded um, through our omnibus bill as well that will address some of those issues. Um, so those are a few sort of um, victories, I guess you would say, in terms of in terms of the work that we've done on PFAS. Um, there has been ongoing work by the Department of Health and the MPCA to address PFAS for several years now. Um, a, a lot of the sort of momentum around this issue really came about because of what happened in the East Metro with 3M. Um, and there had been some work before that, but that was really sort of um, a catalyst for a lot more sort of cross-agency work on, um, on this issue of PFAS and PFAS contamination. Um, and as Jay mentioned, the, the agencies, different agencies actually came together to um, prepare a PFAS blueprint. So sort of a short-term, long-term um, uh, template for what, issue, what issues need to be addressed in terms of um, being able to prevent T PFAS contamination and being able to address it um, where it already exists. And so MDH, MPCA, and several other agencies came together to develop this blueprint. It's very long, it's very detailed, um, but it has some really good ideas for sort of what do we continue to do, what work we need to do, and um, where do we sort of need funding to address other issues. Uh, one piece of legislation that um, didn't pass this session that I carried was um, legislation to, to designate PFAS as a hazardous substance. So essentially what this does is it, it sort of, it, it makes it um, a little bit easier and, and more efficient to sort of um, let the MPCA and uh, engage in cleanup efforts. So it's easier instead of having to go through all these hurdles that are sort of part of the normal process, um, it, it makes that process a little bit more efficient so that they're able to clean that up um, in a relatively um, quick manner and not having to sort of go through all of the hoops that they normally would to, to do that cleanup. Um, and as we know, because we know the health impacts of PFAS and we know that it can migrate and get into drinking water, it's really important that we have the ability to clean it up quickly instead of having to wait months, years um, to be able to clean that up. Um, so this is this is something that, you know, will continue to discuss and continue to talk about uh, next session. One of the big um, concerns was sort of around, again, those, those facilities that don't produce PFAS products or they don't, they're not actually contributing to it. They're just sort of, it's just sort of getting passed along in the process. And so wanting to make sure that when we're talking about responsibility for that cleanup, that we're really talking about the, the facilities and the, and the businesses that are producing the products and not those that just happen to have um, the contamination coming through their facilities. So we'll continue to work on that and try and, and do some work there. Um, there's also been a lot of uh, recent conversation at the federal level about PFAS. Um, so the EPA has been doing some work there and obviously those processes tend to take quite a while, but they have been looking at um, PFAS and wastewater um, as well as sort of PFAS contamination and how, um, how the chemical itself could be um, Manage differently and sort of how chemicals in general are regulated, I think um, is, is a concern. Um, and I think especially with PFAS and finding out sort of the, the magnitude of the contamination and um, that's just what we know. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of contamination out there that we actually don't know about because we haven't, we haven't tested for it or we haven't had um, necessarily indications of the need to test for it. Um, there was some recent uh, conversation locally about PFAS in water. And so I, I believe it was WCCO who had some news reports on the issue recently that they were doing testing in, in certain places around the state because of elevated levels they found in various other efforts. And so that's sort of an ongoing process. And then also um, with the Department of Health and um, drinking water standards and different other standards that exist, um, continuing to update those as we learn more about PFAS and the impacts it has on human health and the environment. Um, I think next steps are really um, to sort of pursue the things that we've already sort of been discussing, the, the designation as a hazardous substance to make it easier to clean up. And then there's a whole bunch of short-term and long-term um, sort of policy initiatives that the PFAS blueprint has put forth. And some of those we were able to address this legislative session with some of the funding things that I mentioned um, and some sort of are, are, didn't get fully addressed or they need to, um, they need to work on other issues. And, and obviously with the short term, um, short term when we talk about state government um, is not the same thing as what we would consider short term in other sort of areas. So I think that's, that's an important piece of 
of the conversation is that short term, uh, when we're talking about these sort of efforts, often take quite a while to actually implement and to, to, to get the information and the data and the testing and everything that we need to do in order to move forward. And then the long term, obviously, would be even further out than that. And I think there's a variety of things that um, we can pursue. I mean, there's the hazardous substance designation I already talked about. Um, there's also, as Jay mentioned, the the um, disclosure requirement. So uh, requiring facilities to submit information about PFAS in products or processes that they use so that people are more aware of that. And the MPCA has more information that they can use to, um, to, to regulate that those chemicals and also to try and reduce the production. Um, there's, there's still a need to sort of um, figure out what we do at the end, right? When PFAS is getting uh, getting into landfills and compost facilities and wastewater treatment plants, and so that's that's another piece that I think there will be more work on um, in the future as we learn more about PFAS and where it is and where it ends up. Um, as I mentioned earlier about the closed the closed landfills across the state, um, there's going to have to be work done on that in order to uh, figure out you know where where it's coming from, what the sources are, and then how do we how do we address the PFAS that's already in the environment um, from these closed landfill sites? Um, there's also, uh, you know, continuing work on just learning more, right, with the science. As Jay said earlier, there's there's not there's not a lot of science around these chemicals, and so there's a need for um, both. I would say at the state and federal level for there to be more research done into these chemicals to figure out, um, you know. What more we can do to to prevent the pollution, and then what happens on the back end in terms of treatment um, if if things are showing up in, in groundwater and drinking water. Um, I think there's also conversation to be had about um, how we regulate chemicals in general in this country. Um, it's a it's a sort of thing where um, there's I don't even know how many chemicals, a lot of chemicals, and a lot of you know there's no real requirement that they are tested. That we actually have data and research on um, on the impacts on the environment and human health. And so that that we only really find out after the fact when there's research done on a chemical and, oh, we find out that it's actually really terrible and we probably shouldn't be using it. Um, and that's been the case with many chemicals over the years. I think we've, you know, we've talked about BPA, um, TCE, which was a chemical that was being used by water gremlin, um, and a whole host of other chemicals we just don't know a lot about. Um, and when we do research, unsurprisingly, we find out they're toxic and that they have really bad impacts on human health and environment. Um, so that's sort of, I'll, I'll sort of wrap there. And I, I haven't been watching the, the chat because I've been sort of looking at a few things here, but I'm gonna share, um, if it hasn't been shared already, and if it has, you'll just have it again, um, the link to the PFAS blueprint. Um, so for folks who wanna look more at some of, the, some of the legislative proposals and some of the details about that, it's a really, it's a really great document. Um, There's a lot of work and effort put into that document and it really, um, discusses a lot of the, the science and the research, but also sort of what we do moving forward to um, address this issue. And I will say, since I see people posting things, I am not running for re-election next year. So there's, so I'm just saying that so folks don't feel like they have to uh, support me in the next election. So just putting that out there. Well, we are doing fellers after all. Um, <laughs> One quick question for both Jay and Amy, um, and I think both of you have touched on this a little bit already, but as the Environmental Caucus moves towards precinct caucus time on February 1st, uh, we need to start putting together some resolutions that we hope uh, will make it through the process statewide and into the state convention. Are there any particular topics we should try and focus on? Any questions for both of you? I mean, I would say um, just generally just advancing some of the some of the initiatives that we've already started. Um, so there's already been work done on um, that one specific piece that I mentioned about um, designating PFAS as a hazardous substance to make cleanup easier. Um, so that's a piece that would be something worthy of discussion, um, resolution, whatever form it takes. Um, and then I would say generally speaking, um, sort of for legislators to pay more attention to the issue. I think the, the agencies sort of understand and, and some legislators like myself who have worked on this issue sort of understand the urgency of, of dealing with this problem and how big it really is. But I think there needs to be more attention um, 
uh, sort of given to this issue and to how big of an impact it's going to have. I mean, we know that the 3M settlement isn't going to cover everything um, that needs to be covered in terms of cleanup and treatment. And so this is gonna cost uh, the state of Minnesota who knows how much to clean up and to, to address. And I think it's really important that we, we focus on it now and we learn more about um, the sort of the amount, the, the extent of the issue. And so that we can actually take action um, in the future to clean up, prevent that sort of thing. So I would say a, be, a, a bigger focus on it is important. And if I may, just real quickly to follow up on that, I think it's really important and I want to emphasize how much easier it is, even though it still will be complicated, but how much easier it is to deal with this on the front end. Um, as we've seen in the East Metro, once it gets into the groundwater, once we have to clean up the problem, it's hugely complicated, horribly complex, and um, it's just not where we want to be. So I think the emphasis should be on preventing PFAS from getting into the environment. Um, that's why I think, you know, uh, bans or labeling are also really effective ways that kind of slow in that trickle down. Um, but, you know, this isn't something that we can clean ourselves out of. And I would, I would also say just raising awareness about it, I think is important because a lot of people don't, don't know what PFAS is. They don't know why it's bad um, for human health and the environment. And I think that's a piece too of, of, you know, taking some of these issues and really um, having some publicity campaigns, awareness campaigns about them, because we may label something that says that this has PFAS in it, but if people don't understand why PFAS is bad um, or what it does, they may not understand why that labeling is important um, and understand what that means for them in terms of the products they use. Yeah, in talking with the agencies, PCA, DNR, you know, they emphasize that a lot of Minnesota just thinks this is an East Metro problem and they think it's just isolated there and they don't have to worry about it. Uh, and we just keep hearing more and more reports about, you know, the St. Louis River, uh, the Smelt and Lake Superior, the Bemidji Airport. I mean, there are going to be more and more of these sites that pop up. And we like people to know about this issue now rather than learn about it when they get a letter in the mail that says, don't drink your water. Um, so I think, yeah, you know, you're right, Representative, like the public awareness campaign, you know, I think we do need to start almost from basic, from the scratch here. Okay, we do have some questions in the chat, but would like people to use the raised hand feature. And uh, uh, Libby's got her hand up. Go ahead, why don't you un unmute yourself? Yeah, thanks. Thank, thank you very much for the presentations. I, you know, I had a question about the companies that are phasing them out of the food packaging. Do we know if they're just removing them or are they substituting other compounds? Because the reason I ask is going back to the ozone hole issue when they uh, companies replace CFCs with HFCs, which now turn out to be powerful greenhouse gases. So I always kind of worry about what's being substituted if that's indeed happening. Do you know anything about that? Um, so what I can say is there's a definition of what PFAS is in the legislation we passed, so they wouldn't be able to use those chemicals that meet that definition, whether they use something that's better or worse for environment and, and, and health, I, don't, I can't say what they're going to do, but I do know that there's been um, quite a bit of industry work on this issue, so there was a few months ago, I think, I, I can never keep track of time anymore, so I think it was a few months ago, but there was actually um, some companies that came out with like a recipe for making packaging that doesn't contain PFAS and they're sharing that. So they, they want the industry to move in that direction. Um, and they want these, these companies that are making these products to make products that don't have these toxic chemicals in them. So that's sort of, that's sort of always the question is, is what are they going to use instead? And a lot of times we don't know if it's better or worse necessarily, because again, there isn't a lot of research or requirements around actually knowing if a chemical is harmful to people. Um, and I think when we talk about food packaging, um, I think we all wanna be reassured that we're not having uh, chemicals, toxic chemicals coming in contact with the food that we eat. I'm looking at the statute right now or the language and it does define PFAS as a family of fluorinated organic chemicals containing at least one fully carbon atom. So I think this is kind of you know, emphasizing that point earlier about not singling certain chemicals out you have to just kind of do it on a broad stroke. Um, you know, we hope the alternative is better, but I think this is a great way of eliminating that source of PFAS into the state of Minnesota. And I'll just add to, um, there was federal efforts to sort of not use certain types of PFAS, PFOA and PFOS, I believe, um, a long time ago. And the issue was then companies just developed different forms of PFAS, right? They're like, oh, we can't make those ones, so we'll make these ones instead. 
And there's, you know, limited research on those newer ones, but what we know so far is that they're not very different than the, than the PFOS and the PFOA in terms of um, the impacts they have on the environment and human health. So it's sort of a thing of, again, you wanna go, as Jay said, go for that class of chemicals as opposed to specific ones, because uh, we're, we're finding that the, the new ones are not really that much better in terms of the purposes we're trying to, to achieve here for human health and the environment. All right, is there a safe way to dispose of my old um, nonstick cookware? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I would say don't throw it in your trash. Um, I don't know if the state has any facilities set up for accepting this type of waste. Um, you know, that is also a solution, an option to figure out, you know, a potential area where these should be disposed of, um, if they can be dropped off at your county hazardous waste facility. Uh, but that's a great question, Steve, that unfortunately I do not have um, this, a simple answer for you. My suggestion would be to reach out to your county. Um, I know I've, our Ramsey County has a um, people who staff their recycling line that you can call and ask about that question. And I was a, essentially told if it wasn't nonstick that it could go in the trash. But if it's, if it is nonstick, I would imagine that's probably hazardous waste. But I think counties would be, county folks would probably be better to answer that question if they run their own if they have those sort of hazardous waste sites or the recycling sites. All right. Um, PFAS in biosolids, is it winding up uh, getting spread on farm fields? Yes, yeah, so I, I see there's a, you know, a, a bit of chat going on about this and I don't know a ton of information about this. I was trying to look at the, the blueprint that uh, Representative Wazalik mentioned. I'm sorry, I keep mispronouncing your name. Um, and there is a lot of information about biosolids and other you know, PFAS issues. And you know, the PCA and other agencies do mention this as a problem, that it is, does get applied onto fields, that then there is some uptake into the crops and it enters our food stream. Um, the agencies do say in that blueprint that they really don't know um, how the transport of these chemicals work. Um, so there is a big knowledge gap there, but there is concern that you know, it does enter our food supply um, via biosolids being applied on agricultural fields. All right, Vita has her hand up. Thank you. Um, I'm a cancer survivor too. So I, I find all of these chemicals in our environment that we're releasing without having tested them, right? They don't have to test them first. They just use them and release them. And now we're dealing with all this stuff. I teach my biology kids about bioaccumulation, bioconcentration, all that, right? We understand what, why, how, how do we get a regulation that says you have to test before you're allowed to use a compound. I mean, we can't do this for every single one, have a 20 year fight to get what we need done, right? I mean, that's what seems to happen with these things. It takes decades to get the action we need. We stopped using DDT finally, right? We have banned some insecticides. We gotta turn it around, Jay, Jay and, and Amy, how can we get our legislature to, to make a, 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 a of a law that says you must test first and prove that it's safe, just like we want them to prove it first with mining. I mean, that would have to be federal, first of all, because you could never ever do that state by state. Um, and I don't think we're in a political environment where that would happen anytime soon. I, I refer to the chemical industry as big chemical um, because they're just like any other uh, lobbying group. They have a lot of money and a lot of power. Um, and you know they don't they don't want to make changes and they don't want to do anything that's going to prevent them from uh, essentially making profit. So I would say I mean it's certainly a federal issue. How we would go about it, I don't know. Um, I know less about um, chemical regulation at the at the federal level because I'm just not elected at that level. But um, there has been conversation on the state level. Um, I think it was the summer of it was either this summer or last summer. Um, the MPCA actually had a a meeting about um, making some of the things, some of the chemicals that they uh, ask companies to voluntarily report to actually make that mandatory and PFAS is one of those. Um, and so there is some conversation about like having more, more mandatory requirements on, on facilities so that they, the MPCA has more information. And so if they were finding, you know, an alarming level of some chemical, whether it's PFAS or something else in this mandatory reporting that's required, um, they would know there's an issue and they could address it. Well, right now it's it's left to 
the facilities and the companies to do that as, as a voluntary measure. And so I think that's that's something that can be done here to get a better grasp on what sort of chemical exposure is happening. But I think any regulations to you know big chemical generally are going to have to be done on the federal level. It's going to be a heavy lift. Um, and I I just I, I think one of the things is having to come up with a chemical that does one thing, right? Like I think there's there's a lot of chemicals that already exist um, that are used for lots of things. And it seems like it's sort of a, just a money maker. I, and I don't know, I'm just, I'm just sort of going off the cuff here, but it seems like some of these chemicals are just, they're just making new ones because they can make money and there isn't a requirement to test. And I think if you had that requirement beforehand, I mean, it would be, it would require a substantial amount of money. It would require a substantial, a substantial amount of resources um, to do that testing. And then at the end of it, you know, there's always a question of if you can actually conclusively prove something. And I think that the, the good thing about the testing is you're more likely to be able to do that as opposed to human exposure, where you have all these different factors that impact humans and, and them and their daily lives. And it's hard to uh, pin down or make that connection between a chemical and someone's cancer or someone's uh, other illness that they might suffer from. So it's, I, I've definitely had that conversation uh, at the state level and um, with my colleagues about doing that at the federal level. And it's just a big, it's a big thing, but I think it's certainly worth pursuing. Um, Europe has much more stringent uh, regulations on chemicals than we do. So there are other places that that do it and do it well. It's just a matter of having the political will to stand up and actually get it done. Yeah, well, and the model is certainly there with uh, the Food and Drug Administration. You know, you don't bring in new drugs on the market until they've been adequately tested. Um, you know, just a matter of applying that sort of requirement to introducing new products. Mm -hmm. And I'll probably, are you say something? Yeah, I'll probably get myself into trouble talking about things I'm not too familiar with, but there is a federal law called the Toxic Substances Control Act or TSCA that is supposed to require kind of pre-manufactured notice to the EPA before a chemical company elects to manufacture and put into the stream of commerce a chemical. But there are all sorts of loopholes um, there are these exceptions, uh, byproduct exceptions, polymer exceptions, various exceptions that these companies can point to to say, look, we don't need to tell you what we're producing until it's, you know, kind of too late, if you will. So again, you know, this is federal issue that I think we could potentially push our lawmakers to try to take action on this. But yes, it would be you know, an uphill battle given the kind of entrenched industry that you'd be facing. Uh, but in theory, there is a regime in place that is supposed to say, look, we're not going to allow you to put these into the stream of commerce into environment until we know what they are, but it just doesn't work as intended. All right, uh, Wesley had a question in the chat about uh, you know, are there attempts to track the cancer trends around some of these sites, and I'm not aware of any. But can you hear me? I'm not aware either. Um, I think there's sort of broader level data that's tracked somewhere within probably MDH. Um, I'm not sure how specific it gets, but I know there was some, there were some questions around that with water gremlin and that they wanted to look, they actually, I don't remember if that was funded or if that was part of the, somewhere along the line it got done and they essentially looked by census tract and they were able to look at different sorts of cancer rates and that sort of thing to see if there was higher incidence of cancer closer to the facility. Um, and so there is there is the ability to do that. I don't know how often it happens or if it's just when you have something like a, like a big thing like water gremlin or 3M or if there's if it, if it's a broader level that they're doing it at. So I, I can't speak to that, but I know that in the case of water gremlin, that was something that the community wanted to have happen that they wanted some information on that to sort of know more about it and reassure themselves about it as well. There are some questions about what happens with the biosolids at the Metro plant and at Pigsive, which treats 80% of the Twin Cities waste. Uh, and, and those biosolids are incinerated and the ash that result uh, is uh, turned into some kind of cement block type substance. Um, I'm not sure exactly where all that winds up, but I've seen something in the past. Um, Sam Rosemark, you have, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi all, uh, thanks so much for the presentation and information. Um, so I'm from Oakdale, Minnesota, so kind of at the heart of all this as well. Um, so I guess one question I have is, um, so the, the 3M settlement focuses a lot on 
kind of environmental damages, but it doesn't necessarily focus a lot on health effects, though, you know, clean water is part of that. Um, what can be done to kind of get justice in terms of the health effects? Um, for example, is like medical monitoring, um, having a program or kind of what was mentioned before, tracking cancer rates, um, what can be done possibly to address that aspect of all this? Thank you. Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think if they're not doing it already, I would push the state agencies, Department of Health to begin monitoring and just really collecting information from the public in this area to try to track any elevated incidence of cancers down the road or other types of health effects. You know, one of the difficult things, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I think oftentimes in lawsuits and litigation, and one of the problems with a lot of these, I'll call them product <laughs> where you try to say a certain product caused a harm is, you know, after you drink the drinking water for 20 years, you know, you've also been eating a bunch of other foods, doing a lot of traveling, you know, playing in the dirt over there and over here. It's hard to link the specific health effect to the PFAS in your drinking water. But I think there is an opportunity if we can show kind of a cluster of people, you know, that live in the East Metro that down the road have health effects, you know, there might be some justice there. Uh, because it's a lot easier to prove. It's not just one-off, it's more of a community-based effect. Um, but a lot of this requires the data collection from our agencies, because uh, I doubt 3M is gonna do that on their own. So I would you know, just reach out to your representatives in the area and make sure that the state agencies are collecting this data, um, because I think it's hugely important. Um, one of the things that we tried to do with Water Gremlin was um, sort of in the, in the broader conversation about these settlements, um, and these stipulation agreements and these other things, these other sort of settlement documents and things that come out of these, these big decisions, the, the big uh, cases with the MPCA, um, is we actually um, tried to, um, I think it was, I wanna say Representative Lee, Fu Lee, um, I think he was carrying legislation, has been carrying legislation for a while um, to direct a certain percentage of the settlement money to the local, like a local public health um, board or group um, organization. Um, so that they could actually consult with the community and say, you know, what would you like some of this money spent on? Um, so in the case of Water Gremlin, they spent a bunch of money on planting trees. Um, and, and no one in the community was super excited about them planting trees after they had polluted their air uh, for over two decades. Um, and so there, there is sort of that conversation to be had too about how do we ensure that the community that's impacted is actually engaged in the conversation. And so it could happen that the community could say, we want this money to be spent on a health impact study um, to track these indica health indicators um, to, to check and see what they have been like, to see what they're like now, and then to track them in the future. So that is a possibility of, of that you're, you're probably more likely to get when you have the community engaged and involved, because as you're saying yourself as a community member, you're interested in, in that, that topic. And I think there's a lot of interest among community members who have been exposed that they want to know about those health risks and the trends in the future. Thanks. Uh, John Wells had his hand up a bit ago. I, I did. I just wanted to confirm what Jay said about the uh, Federal Toxic Substance, Substances Control Act. Um, it, there's a summary. I just I had been Googling it before Jay brought it up, but um, uh, there's a, a, a nice summary of it under EPA.gov. And um, among the authorities are to review uh, most new chemicals before they are manufactured. Uh, on Moss, I assume is what that means, but um, and, but they uh, also point out that um, um, certain sub substances are generally excluded from the the law, uh, including among others food. I don't know what they mean by that. Uh, drugs, cosmetics, and pesticides. So it doesn't seem like PFAS often includes or is part of that but somehow they uh, they're shying away from it it might be something as silly as uh, epa not having enough staff to devote to, to it um, but anyway there is a, a federal opportunity there for strengthening that um, they do single out that law does single out lead and formaldehyde and a few other compounds to give special emphasis on so one simple change haha <laughs> would be to uh, add pfas to that um, uh, so that you give special scrutiny to those substances in the federal law, and the states have a role in it, but I but I think it's uh, it's bounded by the federal role. 
Yeah, there was a, I was reading a really helpful petition that Earth Justice um, sent to the government about pre-manufactured notices and trying to close some of those loopholes. Um, and yeah, I mean, there is, you know, we do have this system in place that is supposed to work, but for reasons that are often as simple as, you know, the EPA has too many chemicals to review, so they don't review them in time and the way that the law is written, if they don't review them in 30 days, they're the chemical manufacturers able to put them into the environment. So, you know, if you swamp the EPA with a bunch of chemicals, some of them are bound to get through because they just don't have enough people to review them. Um, so sometimes the solutions are as simple as, you know, maybe hire more people, but oftentimes the solutions are a lot more complicated. Um, and thank you, John, for that. Um, I do think the federal angle is something that, you know, would be great to have kind of a nationwide approach here. But I do want to emphasize that I think Minnesota has a real opportunity as well. Uh, one thing I do want to just step back to one second is there was a discussion about, you know, the incinerator and burning biosolids. And, you know, not to scare people even further, but there is a bit about this on the blueprint as well. And the PCA just says, look, we don't know if incineration completely destroys PFAS. Um, there are lawsuits in New York State that are pending that are linking PFAS incinerator, PFAS kind of emitting from an incinerator. So, you know, the fact that we're trying to burn these chemicals, these uh, you know, chemicals are very robust. They don't break down and they may even withstand really high temperatures. So we might be kind of spreading them out in the environment um, through this incineration. And that's just another one of those knowledge gaps that we're trying to fill. Interesting, way too many knowledge gaps. Uh, there was a question in the chat. Does, does the PCA have any regulatory authority already that they might be able to use here? I mean, the, I think no, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I think a lot of what MPCA does is they respond to things, right? So there's not a whole lot. I mean, I think that's the whole point of having this conversation about how do we prevent PFAS from getting into the environment and impacting the environment and human health in the first place, because um, a lot of the a lot of the regulatory things that the MPCA does um, is is responding to things, right? So 3M, Water Gremlin, all these different facilities, they really were responding and then saying, you did bad things, now you have to pay lots of money and do these things. And there's not really, um, I, I, I certainly don't think the uh, agency has the resources, even if they wanted to do something more on the prevention end or, or on the uh, beyond just responding to things. But I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on all of the things the MPCA does. So I'll leave that open for other folks to respond to. Yeah, I'm also not an expert on this, but I do know that, you know, the agencies work kind of hand in glove. So the Department of Health, for example, will set these health based limits for different chemicals and the PCA doesn't really have any authority to do anything until those limits are eclipsed. So, you know, as was just mentioned, until there is a problem, oftentimes PCA and other agencies can't really do anything. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, as we've been talking about, like once you have a problem, you know, sometimes it's it's too late. Should we be getting rid of nonstick cookware? Well, I, I was shopping for some new nonstick cookware like six months ago, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that a lot of the pans had a label on them that said does not contain PFOA or PFOS. You know, again, it probably contains some other type of PFAS that had similar properties. Um, but you know, this was presumably a voluntary effort on behalf of the manufacturer. Um, yeah, Greg, you're probably right. It maybe contains something worse. Um, but, you know, I think there are ways to cook food that do not require your food coming into contact with these chemicals. Um, I think, you know, I think there are solutions to this problem um, for cookware. And, you know, it's up to us to kind of push our agencies and you know, legislature to take some change to, to avoid those products from staying in the marketplace. And what worries me is that, you know, we know about the health effects of PFOA and PFOS. Uh, it's all these others that um, have substituted for it that we really don't know very much about yet. Uh, in 20 years, we'll know a lot more and we may be even more scared. Um, well, and I, I think that's sort of why we ban things, right? Because then you push the companies to do something else because there's a whole lot of money they can put into research if they wanted to do it, but unless you force them to stop using a certain product, they're going to keep using it because it's there and they know how to use it. So I think that's a piece too is 
talking about what, what, what products we ban and what uses we ban and then pushing the companies to, to do that research um, to figure out alternatives that are safer. All right, I'm not seeing any more raised hands at the moment. Um, some comments about stainless steel and cast iron skillets. But, um, anyone else have a question? Uh, this has been a very interesting conversation. Um, but, I just uh, wonder about all the health effects of of all the food I've burned on stainless steel pans. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Okay. I can comment on that, John. <laughs> it's actually, in my area of expertise, ah. if you if you feed um, as a bioanthropologist, if you feed lab rats food that has been cooked in the human normal human ways, meats and so on, has been cooked normal human ways, they tend to get cancer so fast you have to write your data down really fast. Um, <laughs> but humans started cooking food about two million years ago, and we appear to be actually relatively immune to the things that that bother rodents. So. The research that shows that cooking food has sometimes a negative benefit has been very weak. It's all on animals and it doesn't really show up in humans so much. So I think we're okay with the stuff that's burned on. Because of because two species ago or so we invented cooking, we've been doing it now for a long, long time. So I think we're okay, mostly. <laughs> okay. I'm not guaranteeing that, but that's what that's the evolutionary perspective on it. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to take a second and thank so, um, Steve Johnston for all the work he's done on the 3M Citizens Advisory Committee. And thank you so much, Representative Wazlawak. Oh, we do have one more question. Peter Berglund, you just raised your hand. Yeah, I put a comment in the chat about evaluating new chemicals. I mean, there ought to be a, there could be some kind of a, a certification system where someone determines develops a procedure to evaluate chemicals and their environmental fate. And the manufacturers would pay a third party certification laboratory type of an organization to conduct this study. And then, so the government, the manufacturers are paying for it. We don't have to have taxpayer EPA staff doing it, but the EPA could oversee the program and, and stop, stop the release of new chemicals into the marketplace that have not been thoroughly evaluated. I mean, that's, that's a, a great idea. You know, I think it's solutions like that and creative thinking like that that's gonna make progress on this. And yeah, I mean, I, I had to read it three or four times to make sure I understand it, that you know, if the EPA just doesn't get around to looking at these chemicals, then the, the manufacturers get a green light. And that doesn't take, you know, a PhD to, to know that that's just not right. So I think, you know, Peter, you're right that it seems like a, a solution should be available. Yeah, oh, for sure. Okay, well, I'm just gonna take a second, just wrap it up um, and just say so, thank you so much to our um, speakers, Jay, Idness, for all the work you've been doing with MCEA on this, with the educa community education and well beyond um, MCA, for those of you who don't know, Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, they are an incredible organization, a nonprofit organization of attorneys and lobbyists and policy makers. I mean, gosh, you guys are just growing and more robust every day. I know I personally have been working with them. I'm an attorney myself for nonprofit works and everything since probably 2011 or 12. And I'm just so impressed with the staff they have. So thank you so much for all the work you do. And Amy, we are very sad to hear you're not going to be running for re-election, but just want to say thank you so much for all the work you did to get this piece of legislation passed. It is just going to be so incredibly important going forward um, to have this it, it, just one step at a time. And that was a huge step that you were able to make to do that. So thank you for all the work you did for our state with that. Um, and so if anybody has any other questions, oh, when MC, MCEA, you guys do a couple of fundraisers <laughs> here. You guys do a, a couple of big ones. So we will be sure to be sharing that when they come out um, so all of our members can donate and attend. Um, I know we've been sponsors in the past and it's just always great. So thank you so much. If anybody has any other questions, um, you know, go ahead and you can contact our wonderful speakers here. Um, 
they gave you your contact information and um, we'll just go ahead and move on with our caucus meeting if everyone's okay. I'm gonna stop recording the forum so we can share this widely because I mean, this has just been great, whether it's been scary, but also this, there's so many prospects out there of what can be done. Um, so it was great to know that, you know, there is hope in the long run. All right.